Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Gayatri Gopinath. I'm director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at NYU. Welcome to the panel, How to Have Sex in a Pandemic, Intimacy, Disease, and the Politics of Vulnerability. Um, this is actually our kickoff event for fall 2020, and I really can't think of a better way to begin. So thank you so much for being with us. So here's how the event is going to go. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to turn the floor over to our moderator, Chandan Reddy. Um, who will frame the panel for us, and then the panelists will speak for about seven minutes or so. Um, and then Chandan will moderate a discussion between the panelists for about 20 minutes. And after that, we'll open up uh, the floor to you, the audience, for a Q&A. And if you could please post your questions in the Q&A function, not in the chat, um, we'll be able to access it there. Um, and we aim to end the event at around 7.15 or so. So I'd like to begin by just thanking our co-sponsors, the NYU Department of Performance Studies, the Institute of African American Affairs, and the Center for Black Visual Culture, and the Latinx Project. Thanks also to our Associate Director of CSGS, Robert Campbell, who is actually mastering this format as we speak, as well as, um, I'm very grateful to him, um, as well as um, to our student assistants, Sonia and Eleni, who are also with us. Um, so I'm not going to do a lengthy introduction to the panelists as we really don't have very much time together, but their bios, we're going to post their bios in the chat and you can also access their bios online. So I'm just going to do a very quick introduction here. So Chandan Reddy is Associate Professor in the Departments of Gender, Women and Sexuality Studies and the Comparative History of Ideas at the University of Washington, Seattle. He is the author of Freedom with Violence, Race, Sexuality and the U.S. State, which was published by Duke University Press in 2011. Kenyon Farrow is an award-winning writer, activist and strategist. He is currently the co-executive director of Partners for Dignity and Rights, a national organization that partners with communities to build a broad movement for economic and social rights. Next, we'll have Amber Jamila Musser. Amber is Professor of American Studies at George Washington University. Her most recent book is entitled Sensual Excess, Queer Femininity and Brown Jouissance, published by NYU Press in 2018. Then we'll have Juana Maria Rodriguez, professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. She's the author most recently of the book, Sexual Futures, Queer Gestures, and Other Latina Longings from NYU Press in 2014. And finally, we'll have Dean Spade, an associate professor at Seattle University School of Law and the founder of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Dean's most recent book is entitled Mutual Aid, Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next, which I believe is just being published um, this month by Virtu Verso Press. So congratulations, Dean. Um, so let me just say that the initial impetus for this panel was that I really wanted to showcase how queer scholarship and queer activism allow us to make sense of this current pandemic, um, given our long collective history of dealing with exactly these questions of intimacy, disease, vulnerability, contagion. Um, so Chandan and I were actually in conversation about this over the summer, and he shared with me the fact that he's actually teaching a class um, that's engaging precisely with these questions and titled How to Have Sex in a Pandemic. So the title of this panel and its framing are very much indebted to Chandan's work. Um, and together we came up with a group of scholars and activists whom we both admire a great deal, um, who we know have been thinking about these questions for a very long time and really have a lot to teach us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chandan. Hi, can you see me? Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I just want to I just want to start by thanking uh, Gayatri and Robert for all their work, um, especially Robert. Um, he's just been uh, uh, incredible in getting all of us together and keeping us um, into a, in a conversation to today. 
Um, I also want to thank um, our panelists, of course. Um, and it's hard to talk about this moment, um, one that is a moment that is a, in part a bridge between wherever we're headed in the future and where we've been in the past, particularly around HIV and queer formations, without thinking of your all's um, colleague, Jose Munoz. So um, I hope that Jose is somewhere in the room. Um, and I'm, uh, I was thinking about this um, pandemic um, and just all the different kind of emergences that are happening, it was hard to not have Jose's voice in this moment to help us um, think through the, both the humor and complexity of this moment at times. Um, and I'm sure it's even harder for those of you for whom he was community. Um, and then lastly, I just want to say uh, thanks again to the panelists who graciously agreed to share their thinking about this moment and about um, emergent modes of living in and with this moment in all its complexities and multiplicities. As we're only at the beginning of this pandemic, it's a unique challenge to answer the questions about the now. Um, indeed, like all interregnums, ours is a moment in which it's precisely unclear what our present is, out of which contradictions it's made, and what efforts will become the practices that define our social field, and which will become nothing more than yesterday's rubbish. So tonight's panel is, of course, a speculative exercise. There's so much we don't know about this disease, um, about those who have been abandoned and left to die, and about the now. But we hope it can also be a part of the effort to think of our now as a moment destabilized not only by a repugnant political condition, by repugnant political conditions that have created this pandemic, but also by the near limitless inventory of alternatives that have been part of marginalized communities of movements of change, some of which you'll hear about tonight. In other words, if we feel a little disoriented by what the present is and the conditions of living in the now, I want to appreciate that in part such disorientation is a result of awakening to modes of survival and social reproduction that far exceed the organization of space, scales, institutions and relations governed by the state and that are used by capital to thieve our collective social wage. So I hope that part of our disorientation is an awareness of all the possibilities that are emergent in this moment as well. Um, we're gonna hear about some of those alternatives tonight. And so um, uh, I'm very excited for, for tonight's conversation. Um, I'm gonna share my screen for a second. Uh, So um, when COVID began in late February in the United States, that is, I was startled to see how many mainstream corporate media outlets had, led, had lead articles or columns on how to have sex during COVID by as early as um, April 1. And you'll see a lot of these titles are actually in, in March. Clearly, the mainstream line went to this association because, between pandemics and sex without even knowing the reason it did so. Um, was because of the activism of the last pandemic against the homophobic construction around HIV. And straight mainstream folks took for granted their right to, have, uh, to sex positivity and to expect medical experts and the mainstream media to be attentive to their casual sex without having a political relationship to any of this. One, um, one way to think about and talk about the relationship of this pandemic to the last one, which is HIV, is that HIV was about politicizing care and reimagining politics through care work precisely because it was created by communities, gay men, uh, black, uh, uh, black women, queer and trans, black and Latino folks, sex workers, and so on, who were abandoned by the state and had to imagine safety health, life, death, transmission, and loss on their own in the shadow of a violent or absent state. In the case of COVID, or right now, the subject of care is actually the US citizen subject, the subject protected by the state and by the community. And of course, this subject is implicitly white and male and heterosexual, hence the lack of protection for Black and Latino working citizens, quote unquote, 
So all the rubrics sound the same in this pandemic as in the prior pandemic. There's talk about care, sex positivity, intimacy, and so on, but they're fundamentally different. And, um, and we need to sort of get used to this paradox. Um, in another way of putting this is that we're in a kind of long counter-revolution. And what we're seeing is partially the transformation of that prior formation of activism against the state being now transformed into rubrics for uh, state management. Now, the last pandemic in the US, um, which was, was the HIV pandemic, since SARS-1 and the chicken flu and H1N1 um, were all supposedly stopped at the border. Um, so it's no surprise that HIV and its discourses um, are now the infrastructure, the, uh, the form of public health governance we practice, including the institutions that are charged with dealing with this pandemic. Um, we're all shaped by HIV, by the world of HIV, and especially by HIV activism. Indeed, and sadly, the very inequalities of race and gender that queers and trans folks of color and women of color sought to politicize about their unequal access to health and the racial dissymmetries in infection and deaths have been the very same inequalities, dissymmetries, and pathways that COVID-19 has reproduced. So in other words, the HIV pandemic, the, the disproportionate racially and, and, and sexual and gender disproportionate and dissymmetrical life chances are not prior, they're the ongoing ones in this moment as well. Um, so um, some of the context behind this um, panel, that, that's some of the context behind this panel. Um, these are just the original how to have sex in an epidemic manual, um, and this is the content of that manual, if you're curious. Um, one of the things that's quite amazing about this manual, by the way, is actually how detailed it is on safer sex, um, rather than abstracted, um, precisely because it was created for community practices and knowledges. Um, so um, with that, I just want to uh, uh, help us move to a conversation with our panelists. Um, and we had a series of questions for the panelists. One, um, maybe to start with Kenyon, um, was about how they see the relationship between the work that's happening around HIV activism and the work that's happening now in the context of COVID and the movement for Black Lives. So I'll hand it over to Kenyon first. And if I can just ask all the panelists to actually put their cameras on and leave their um, audio muted. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for the uh, invitation to uh, chat and, and uh, talk to everybody tonight. Um, so I think for me, uh, to this question, um, you know, I think a lot about, um, you know, the kind of origin story of HIV, at least the one that we generally like to tell um, in the United States, and kind of thinking about the origins of COVID to sort of think about um, how uh, epidemics or pandemics are constructed. Um, in terms of narratives, in terms of media, et cetera, and, um, and then how then uh, kind of activism sort of responds to those moments based on it. And I think one of the things that, you know, we often, you know, sort of say or you hear in the sort of general discussion about um, the onset of uh, HIV or at least the discovery of the virus you know, in that sort of famous June 5th, 1981 uh, CDC report about, uh, you know, a hand like five, I think, or seven, uh, you know, homosexuals who uh, were uh, dying of uh, rare pneumonias and, and rare cancers, ultimately. Um, and obviously, you know, that is often constructed and you will hear people say things like, uh, you know, so first it was a, you know, white gay disease, right? And then, the you know epidemic became uh, you know more black and brown disease by the time we get to the you know late 80s early 90s when that becomes more of how the media is, is sort of paying attention to the epidemic. Um, but first and foremost, I mean we know that uh, even in terms of the U.S. history, that that is sort of a false starting point. That there's uh, evidence of a, a young man uh, from St. Louis who was Black, who was uh, 15 years old, I believe, who died uh, in the late 1960s um, of AIDS. Um, and part of what happened was that his, it was unclear as to what 
he was actually suffering from at the time. There was no, obviously, HIV test or wasn't in the context of uh, the way people thought about the, uh, you know, about kind of what was happening um, at that point. So, um, you know, his tissue was froze after he died. And later in the 1980s, it was actually discovered at Tulane University in New Orleans once they looked at his tissue again that this young man had died of AIDS, right? So I think if we have to kind of draw <laughs> that origin story, you know, paint a different picture. I'll drop, if people are unfamiliar with his case, um, I'll drop some links uh, to uh, some work, uh, you know, most notably by uh, activist Ted Kerr here in the United States, who's done a lot of work to resurface um, and talk about, um, you know, Robert's story. Um, but if we talk about the 1980s, even, even that isn't exactly the way in which HIV sort of, you know, uh, happens. It is the way in which uh, public health responds to it. But as early as the 1982, the Reagan administration actually knew that there were people, uh, men who were uh, of Haitian descent who were being held in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, uh, because they were fleeing to try to get to, you know, um, out of Haiti for um, political reasons and were arrested and kept and prevented from entering the United States, that um, several dozen of those men were in fact HIV positive at the time. And the ways in which the, the US had started to ban people from Haiti entering the United States in the early, in like 1982, 1983, before we, you know, so, so this idea that, you know, AIDS starts with white gay men as opposed to the way in which the federal government was already responding to it as a kind of quote unquote foreign crisis vis-a-vis -vis Black Haitians um, is another kind of origin piece that we have to, I think, kind of keep in mind. So I raised that um, when we talk about COVID to then look at the ways in which um, there are kind of similarities and differences. So. Obviously, I think that the uh, you know there's been a lot of writing about the comparison between both both pandemics and and what have you. I think that they're obviously very different. I think in the case of HIV, we're you know obviously still dealing with a disease that, frankly, to me, is still more stigmatized in terms of people contracting it. If you had had you know 20 people in a White House administration contract HIV at one point, we would not know it at this, you know, we, we, would, ne we would never even get that level of like disclosure about it, um, you know, at this point. But that is, so it, it tells you something still about the level of, of stigma that people still feel around an HIV diagnosis, largely which is connected to um, sex and drugs, right? So you think about the connection of kind of moral panics that still exist um, you know, in terms of this particular infectious disease as opposed to COVID, you know, being, uh, you know, sort of born out of a similar sort of flu virus and being, you know, airborne or through sort of, you know, droplets. And so there's a, a different way the sort of innocence frame can be painted more broadly, um, you know, at least at this point. But I think uh, there's obviously evidence through which we can look at how even that is uh, kind of changing in terms of the discourse. Um, one of the, the ways is, and I think obviously, you know, in terms of HIV, you know, there's, there's always the sort of underlying question about a person who uh, contracts HIV, well, how, right, and, and how did you get it, right, and people I know who I love who are HIV positive still deal with those questions. Um, which is not a question that people would generally ask in terms of, of, of COVID. Um, however, I think that the ways in which um, we see uh, the criminalizing of HIV status through various state laws that criminalize non-disclosure of HIV status or exposure to HIV, even if no transmission took place or what have you, um, we are beginning to see in the context of COVID uh, certain kinds of criminalization, which isn't necessarily criminalizing, you know, queer or trans or, or folks or drug users or sex workers in, in that kind of way, but it's being sort of contorted around uh, groups that are like if people aren't, uh, you know, following the various sort of public health measures, right? So we are seeing people in black and brown communities in the United States be arrested for or given uh you know tickets for not social distancing 
or for not wearing masks. And by you know comparison, also be uh, have the cops called on you if you're in a grocery store wearing a mask as a black person, right? Like that's also happening because the assumption is that you're there to rob a joint. So we're seeing this kind of like ways in which uh, groups are being criminalized. And to just draw the comparison, right? We have armed white nationalists, like neo-fascist militias who are storming state houses all around the country with arms, not social distancing, not wearing masks, and, and threatening the assassination of, of public health officials and, and uh, elected officials, right? And, and, and nowhere are we seeing summons, tickets, forces to you know, disrupt those, those gatherings. Um, and it's a very interesting comparison when we look at what's also happening at the same time of the COVID uh, pandemic in terms of the uprisings around you know, uh, sort of Black Lives Matter and the kind of murder of, of George Floyd and, and uh, Breonna Taylor in particular as kind of two, uh, you know, uh, points of, 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 of uh, you know, sort of mobilizing that's happened around the country. Um, I'll just say this quickly about where I see, um, you know, the, the space of, of activism and some of the differences. Um, you know, so what's interesting to me, um, as somebody who has kind of had a, a career working in kind of various, you know, social movement sort of buckets, right, partly organizing with queer youth of color around criminalization issues in the West Village and then uh, on to critical resistance, doing prison abolition work and then, uh, you know, spent years doing, you know, work with queer folks in the shelter system at Queer Street Economic Justice and in the last decade really focused um, on HIV and public health issues um, that I have been sometimes very enraged by the lack of um, engagement by various kind of, you know, black and brown social justice kinds of organizations to actually take HIV seriously as a, as a pandemic and as something that's worth their investment in terms of like mobilizing around. I think around some of the same issues, some levels of homophobia, transphobia, levels of the stigma around HIV and sex. Now I have organizers and sometimes very famous and even some very famous academics who when I presented certain things will come up to me and kind of whisper, oh, I'm so glad you talked about HIV, my uncle, my brother, my sister, this, that or whatever, but do not politicize it in the same way that some of the same folks will politicize family members who've been locked up or who've been killed by police, right? So we see that sort of distinction. What's been interesting in the, in the case of COVID is, you know, a lot of my kind of comrades from who are doing, you know, various kinds of work around policing and, uh, you know, the sort of Black Lives Matter movement, et cetera, who started ringing my phone <laughs> to show up and participate in more conversations around the criminalizing of, of COVID uh, that we have been seeing in some of the ways that I mentioned before. Um, and so I think we're kind of at an interesting moment there, I think in terms of really pushing more of the sort of racial justice groups to be thinking about public health and infectious disease differently in terms of, uh, you know, we have a lot more work to do than just uh, mobilizing around the kind of crises that happen when somebody dies at the end of a police revolver, right? That the, the ways in which uh, white supremacy and anti-black racism show up in our lives actually kill far more people through various forms of neglect and deprivation more than they do by policing. And I think we're at a moment where I think we can really sort of bring these things together. And lastly, on the HIV side, um, I also <laughs> have gotten into trouble fighting a lot of the kind of HIV criminalization organizations that have been working to reform some of the HIV criminalization laws I've mentioned. Um, who I felt in different different states that have uh, reformed their laws where say they reduced the penalties for HIV non-disclosure, but then wrote uh, uh, tuberculosis, meningitis, and viral hepatitis into the criminal code where they didn't exist before out of some narrative about equality, right? And me, you know, six years ago in the state of Iowa pushing back against the reform bill there, which was one of the first HIV crime reforms in the country uh, that take place. And now seeing some of those organizations, people who tried to call my job and try to have me fired from Treatment Action Group when I was a policy director because I took the, organ the organization took that position at my behest, um, now begin to actually think about COVID criminalization 
uh, you know, and think beyond just the sort of narrow scope of, of HIV criminalization, really think about reforming public health laws to get rid of the kinds of ways in which public health is deputized to also act in, in concert with, with policing and surveillance entities. So I think that's kind of where we are right now. And uh, I'll leave it there and uh, move on to the next panelist. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kenyon. Um, one of the things about any pandemic is that it disturbs kind of familiar boundaries, including the boundaries of self and other body, what is in the body and what is outside the body, um, relations of body, bodiliness. And so we wanted Amber um, Musser to speak a little bit on some of her ruminations about, about these changes in figurement and disfigurement that are emerging um, in this moment of social experience. Amber, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, um, so I'm really excited to be here with everybody and part of this conversation. Um, admittedly, uh, when I was told that the title was going to be How to Have Sex in a Pandemic, I was like, oh God, I don't know what to say. Um, but I thought uh, a lot that, you know, I, I decided to sort of think a little bit with Leo Bersani um, and sort of the idea that, right, that what is sex but an abnegation of the self. Um, and sort of trying to expand what that means. Um, so I don't think this is exactly what he had in mind, uh, but I will say that the pandemic has profoundly disrupted a concept of self in multiple ways. Um, and I'm not quite, it does a lot of other things to sex, but I'm not totally sure about the connection. So first there's the virus itself, a bundle of RNA that requires a host to replicate. It injects its RNA into cells so that they make more and more copies while becoming unable to perform their original function. Those cells will die and others will become infected. The body launches an immune defense. But at this point, we're not really sure what it means to be over the virus. Does it leave the body? In the case of many long haulers and others who experience periodic resurgences of symptoms, it seems to be more of a question of learning to live with the virus, management as opposed to cure, which is you know, another lesson from HIV AIDS. So this is what's happening at the cellular level. But it's the porosity of, um, but it's also a porosity that's true of the body writ large, right? So we can sort of think about the way that we're composed of many different microbiomes, which are composed of bacteria, archaea, fungi, viruses, protozoa, um, that inhabit all of us, right? So there are parts of so many different types of genetic material all the time at once, but we don't really think about this. But putting this in relation to COVID, COVID might make us aware of the fallacy of the individual not so much from orgasm as much as by announcing our profound lack of sovereignty and asking us to think with multiplicity. For me, this reorientation happened on multiple levels. Living in a locked down New York felt anything but atomistic. And it was during this time that I read the newly minted um, genius N.K. Jemisin's The City We Became, which tells the story of people who awaken one day as the living embodiments of each of the five boroughs. Their mission is to band together to try to save the collective spirit of the city, who's sort of like another person come to life, come to life as a city, um, from the demons of gentrification. So I, I actually have mixed feelings about this book, but I found it like a really profound sort of summoning of what I felt, right? And there was a moment when I thought that that might be the most accurate description of my sexuality, which is to say an orientation toward collectivity. So in this moment, and perhaps also now, I, feel, I felt awash with collective waves of concern, sadness, and worry. Initially, this manifested as sweat. I would wake up soaked and come back from walks with undershirts stuck to me. The night sweats, fever or anxiety. The day sweats, um, COVID-induced hypoxia, more anxiety. Some of the anxiety is personal, right? Related to the conception of individual threat. When someone outside starts to get too close, I can feel it in the back of my neck. Here, psychology and metabolism are inextricable from the limits of the self, already perceived to be under threat, um, are rendered laughable. But sweat is also part of my pandemic residue in that it links me to the larger communities of blackness in this moment and in the past. So many different forms of structural racism go a long way in this moment um, toward explaining why the coronavirus disproportionately affects black people and other people of color who have been marginalized in food deserts, healthcare deserts, Air, po air pollution hotspots and are geographically distant from their jobs, um, which, are all, which are still essential. So this is anxiety of an ex as existential dread. It is anxiety that activates specters of black death, possibilities of black love and care, and knowledge of black forms of survival. This enmeshment is part of what it is to consent to not be a single being. So sweat is also notably a byproduct of breath. Breathing is the first part of respiration, 
It brings oxygen into the body where it ends up producing energy, carbon dioxide, and water, sweat. There is, after all, the bitter irony of yet another mode of choking off air supply circulating within Black communities that makes I can't breathe resonate in other ways. So this refrain has become a way to describe anti-Blackness. Christina Sharp references Eric Garner's death, one of the first times the phrase started to circulate as a rallying cry, as one but an endlessly repeating series of incidents that accumulate as an oppressive atmosphere, which she calls the weather. In my text, the weather is the totality of our environments, the weather is the total climate, and that climate is anti-Black. Later, Sharp works through the term aspiration, another synonym of sorts, in order to ponder the possibility of survival for Black people under these conditions. Survival means allowing for the intake of air. In part, it means carrying, um, carrying through the multi-generational trauma of the transatlantic slave trade, but it also means fusing breath with something else. And this is Sharp. Aspiration here doubles to the necessity of breath, to breathing space, to, br to the breathtaking spaces in the wake in which we live, and to the ways we respond with wonder and admiration. You are still alive, like hydrogen, like oxygen. What Sharp points to toward is the effective access that accompanies survival. It is the place where we might begin to see beyond the mere conditions of being toward thriving. Since it is surplus, it requires the surplus of breath, of breath the energy that it provides in order to make this something else real. So in some ways, this is the landscape that I describe in relation to Brown Jurisance in that it creates beings in its excess, even as it remains moored to an ethos of survival. A Sean Crawley too uses this phrase as a way to think about the multiple types of violence that engulf blackness. It is not just the endlessly repeating legacy to which he refers, but a logic that continues to suffocate and eradicate in multiple permutations. Thus, th thus this statement becomes a call for abolition and a way to approach breathing anew. I can't breathe charges us to do something, to perform, to produce something, other, something otherwise than what we have. We are charged to end, to produce abolition against the episteme that produced for us current iterations of categorical designations of racial hierarchies, class stratifications, gender binaries, mind-body splits. In this space that circulates around breath, both Crawley and Sharp point us towards the excesses that circulate around breathing. So this is the space that I call the energetic because it reminds us of the connection between breath, respiration, and, spe and sweat. It brings us toward the, mecha the, mecha sorry, the, mecha the mechanisms of metabolism. This is to say that respiration is intimately connected with the body's materiality, which is not static, but part of ever-changing ecologies, right? And this is sort of thinking back to the microbiome and sort of all the different parts of us that we seldom acknowledge we, we are. In response to the anti-Black violence that accompanies civil rights struggles of the 1960s, Audre Lorde wrote, one of the most basic Black survival skills is the ability to change, to metabolize experience, good or ill, into something that is useful, lasting, effective. It is unclear what form survival will take, but I know my sweaty clothes are testament to being in the midst of an event, even when the outcome is uncertainty. They index complex forms of effective connection and persistence. So in terms of thinking about metabolism, right, I think this gives us an opportunity to think about what it is to harness these multiplicities and what it is to activate these forms of porosity for transformation, right? Because that's what metabolism is, is taking something in, transforming it into something else. And that, you know, I think we can think about as another version of sex. Um, for me, I still know sex. For me, that's meant a lot of meditation, which is another form of porosity and multiplicity. I know, we're not going to talk about that in the Q&A, but, um, and also I th I've been thinking a lot with Black Lives Matter activist Janiyah Future Khan, um, whose Sunday sermons on Instagram reach hundreds of thousands, right, and I actually have been starting to watch them. They broadcast them on Sundays, uh, noon Pacific Standard Time, but whatever, I watch them at 3 p.m. Um, and it's really amazing the way that they really mobilize this moment, this moment to really, uh, think about the porosity that we're all with and think about entanglement and thinking about allyship as a form of kinship, which I think really speaks toward um, everything that we are sort of part of in this moment of refiguring sex and abandoning the individual. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amber, that was so suggestive. Um, our next speaker is Juana Rodriguez. When we came up with the title, Gaitri and I, we thought, who would be brave enough to actually use the word sex in their art, in their comments? And we came up with Juana. So we're particularly grateful for Juana's 
uh, participation. Thank you so much. Um, I was uh, straight up texting with the person that would become my pandemic lover uh, when I received the email from my forever femme friend Gayatri about participating on this panel. Even as I understood that what I was being asked to speak about was less about the process of finding and negotiating the terms of a hookup and more about sex and survival in a time of COVID, at the time, I was mired in the details. On the line was a very handsome Latinx trans dude who had indicated on the generally tame dating site OkCupid that his favorite thing to do on a first date was shag. Um, I had tried unsuccessfully to find romantic connection on the apps, but this was different. I was in the process of trying to negotiate my first sexual escapade with a stranger in years during a global pandemic. There were details to be discussed. What was his level of public contact? Who did he live with? Who were his other sexual partners? Had he been tested and when? If it's not already clear, I'm single. Being uncoupled, like being coupled or being in a polypod, is one of the things that has defined how we're surviving this crisis. But seven months into the pandemic, celibacy was getting old. With the Bay Area rates of infection continuing to go down, even as nightclubs, travel, and in-person flirting remained far in the distance, I realized this was an opportunity. Now, I understand that not everyone needs or values sex in the same way. For me, giving up on the idea of the possibility of a sexual future just seemed too unimaginable and depressing. Uh, right now, living was just hard enough, so I surged forward. Now, if you've ever spent any time um, on the apps, you know that getting from text to flesh can sometimes take a minute. Um, but when I realized that uh, there were, I'm sorry, I'm a little uh, last here in my notes. Um, now, when, let's see, try to get there. Uh, oh my God. Um, in this case, the task was to get the deets necessary to make an informed decision about COVID exposure, check in with my gut about how much to trust the stranger who was about twice my physical size, arrange the logistics of where and when, limits and desires, all while trying to keep the vibe sufficiently light sexy, fun, against the California backdrop of orange smoke and, you know, the Rona. Luckily, as kinky queers, we both knew how to use our words, but the particulars of risk are, of risk are worth mentioning because they tell us something about sex and vulnerability, and I share them having already secured his consent. They tell us be something about also the challenges that sex workers are facing every single day in this moment, and maybe we can talk about that in Q&A. Almost immediately in the conversation, he indicated that, like me, he's bisexual. He told me that his current sexual life consists of a long-distance romantic partner and a long-standing non-romantic local hookup, both with cis men. He's in his 40s, lives with a female ex-lover and a life who's a life companion. She's in her 60s, retired, doesn't leave the house much. He's a working class guy who has a day job with minimal contact. In my mind, I was already coding these details of race, class, age, sexual practices in relation to risk factors, both real and imagined, that he had a job that was relatively safe, was certainly a plus, even as I thought about how economic privilege shapes ideas of safety and therefore potential sexual desirability. Bisexuals, of course, are always imagined as somehow being more promiscuous and therefore riskier. Yet his claiming bisexuality from the jump 
seemed like a good measure of his trustworthiness in a moment when many people just call themselves queer and skip the details of who or what they're doing sexually. Other than his roommate, because who can afford to live alone in the Bay, um, this is the only person that he lived with. He had this one carnal lover, uh, so he had kind of limited exposure. I live with my 18-year-old who splits his time between three households, myself, his other partner, and his girlfriend. He's also working construction right now. So the truth is that even with precautions, my son was much more of a potential transmission vector than anything in pandemic lover's life. When he arrived at my house around midnight and I opened the door, maskless, to invite him in, I had that flash of realization of the risk that I was about to undertake. Now, COVID is not like HIV. Um, it's not as easily preventable and much more uncertain in terms of its impact. The first time we fought, we didn't kiss, but soon we did, and we continue to. The fact that COVID is life-threatening made my desire for the life-affirming vitality of sexual touch feel all the more urgent, a risk worth taking. And although this became much more than a hookup, it's not about amorous union. It is instead about the joy and intimacy that comes from sharing fragile bodies in a precarious present and the promise of mutual care that can thrive when risk and vulnerability are held together. And maybe that is precisely the kind of care work that sexual contact can aspire to be, the kind of trust and honesty that makes it possible to have our desires, limits, and needs held tenderly. This pandemic has shed light on the kinds of intimacies capable of sustaining us and our role in actively nurturing the social networks of our lives. Who are we calling on the daily? Who are we helping with childcare, elder care, access needs, rent? Who are we helping survive a breakup, survive the profession, or survive eviction? And who are we turning to with our own anxieties and fears? The sustained romantic, sexual, intellectual, spiritual union of coupled life wanting to be someone's singular, special someone is always imagined as that thing that you cannot not want. And yet for me, the pandemic has created another kind of appreciation for the durable and multiple social, sexual, intellectual, material, and spiritual bonds that sustain us as single people. My daily writing partners, the friends with whom I share meals, gossip, emergency evacuation plans, protest planning, the virtual playgrounds where so many of us play. And to this mix of self-care and political survival, I can now add regular sexual touch that feels like a growing bond of cariño, friendship, and care. Today, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Juana. That was truly amazing. Um, our next speaker is Dean Spade. We wanted Dean to expand further on this discussion of care, and in particular, to help us think about um, what the relationship is between the emergence of um, so many mutual aid networks that developed during COVID and their transformation in part into political um, uh, pr uh, efforts and units for the movement for Black Lives um, soon after the um, uh, movements for Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and others. Um, so Dean, do you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you. This has been really amazing. Thanks to all the prior speakers and to the organizers. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've been thinking about mutual aid a lot. Uh, I've been thinking about trying to popularize the idea of mutual aid more a lot since Trump was elected. And in that moment, what I really felt was, I mean, obviously all of us have been doing mutual aid for a long time, but I, what I felt really strongly was that people were really being misdirected about political action and that there was kind of these, you know, there's all these newly mobilizable, angry and scared people. And what we were seeing was like, stories about how like if you donate to the ACLU they'll sue the Trump administration and that'll help or like donate to Planned Parenthood or put stuff on social media um, or vote 
like I just really felt like mutual aid, which is, you know, in my view, the actual on ramp into most social movements. It's what's built. It's what builds people power. Um, like that was invisible. It is invisible in the stories that are told about social movements in the United States. Um, and so, which are stories, which are stories that are made to be about like elite methods instead of grassroots methods. And so, I really wanted to popularize that, and I made this um, website called Big Door Brigade, um, and uh, that was about try to like models for building mutual aid um, organizations um, and just, you know, how that has worked and trying to put that forward. And, um, and a lot of that to me is like when people are in that urgent space of wanting to do something, they usually want to do something that will either immediately help somebody. Like that's the, that is the thing that often moves people into movement or they're seeking help because they're like going to get evicted or they like don't have childcare or whatever the case may be. And so that space of mutual aid groups is the space of, initial contact for most people into social movements and moving from being a passive observer of politics to being like an active participant. Um, and it's a space where people tend to build solidarity because you show up because you've got like, you're upset about or experiencing one particular part of it and then you get there and there's like all the differences between all the people affected by that and all the other levels of the experience that you don't know what that's like for somebody undocumented if you're not undocumented or you didn't think about what that'd be like if you have a criminal record or you didn't know about what people with kids are experiencing and so that people then build solidarities and ideally, um, and you see this through all the strong movements in US history, you know, mutual aid leads to lots and lots of people having each other's backs in new ways and being networked, um, even if they might be specializing in like trying to block the doors to housing court, you know? Um, so anyway, mutual aid feels really essential to me to building people power, which is of course the only kind of power that we have because they have all the guns and money, right? And so it, it's, uh, it's pretty essential. Um, so, and then COVID rolls around as China was just saying, and you actually saw like an explosion of mutual aid projects, people doing groceries and picking up um, each other's uh, uh, prescriptions and all of this stuff, you know, handing out masks and figuring out how to get people hand sanitizer um, and caring about the elders in their neighborhoods, et cetera. And you also saw a real mainstream narrative about mutual aid that I've never seen in my lifetime where that term was like in, like in the New Yorker and the New York Times and all this stuff. Um, and there's a real danger with that around it turning into a story about volunteerism. Um, I think that's like one of the things we should be most concerned about is like that it gets kind of weakened into, because I should have said this in the beginning, to me, mutual aid is when we do work for each other's survival, to meet each other's survival needs with a shared analysis that the system isn't doing that and is actually making survival more impossible for us. Like that's what, that's the difference between mutual aid, one part of it and charity or social services or volunteerism. And so you know, the neoliberal context we live in loves the idea of volunteerism. Oh, absolutely, let's fire all the firefighters and have people just do it for each other. Like, you know, that kind of um, narrative we want to watch out for or a story, they always want to tell a story about how mutual aid um, projects like worked with the police or worked with the National Guard. Like we really want to be careful of that kind of like making mutual aid not oppositional. And in general, um, what I've noticed when I've tried to look at this in different historical moments, different contexts, um, the response to mutual aid is usually kind of three part. One is like ignoring it. You know, like oh, there's a lot of just like it being ignored and not being covered by media and not being covered by, not being acknowledged by, um, by politicians during a crisis or a disaster, co-opting it, right? Like um, trying to make mutual aid like a story about how our city is doing great in this terrible disaster during which the government is doing nothing or whatever, um, or criminalizing it, of course. Obviously the most famous example that people think of in the US is like the police literally raiding the places where Black Panther Party was preparing breakfast for children and like destroying the food. You know, that's as criminal, but we could also see it with the current raids at the border, the no more deaths um, medical camp or, you know, criminalizing mutual aid is a big part of, um, um, you know, the response. In this moment, we're also seeing with a proliferation of mutual aid projects, a chance for people to be doing really deep practicing around like, how do we make these things sustainable? How do we look at conflict inside groups? How do we apply transformative justice principles? How do we make decisions together and not fall into models of charismatic leadership? Um, how do we examine oppressive dynamics between people and groups? Like this is all also this rich, deep conversation that is part of a long lineage of that conversation. Um, of course, that has been primarily um, led by um, uh, women of color feminists and especially black feminists with questions about institutionalization inside organizations and questions about um, power and decision making. Um, the, the key thing for me that I wanted to think about in terms of thinking about HIV and COVID and mutual aid is this question about how, you know, as activists, we're often being like, the government is not dealing with our health crisis or this pandemic well, and like they should do something more. And we know that everything they do is part of their project of racialized gender control, 
And so that whenever they give out relief, whether we're talking about welfare or whether we're, they're creating a public health system, it's always about who they're going to let die. You know, we all live in that, the work that everybody in this channel has done around welfare benefits, around public health systems. And so, um, you know, that moralism and deservingness and eligibility criteria shape this racialized gendered control project that is deadly and is any public health system or public benefit system or poor relief system. Um, and so how do we orient towards this idea of these demands for government intervention in these disasters? And how, what does it make us think about the state is, is really a big question for me, um, especially because even when we win things, they're then delivered in these like, you know, totally fucked up uneven ways. Um, and I think that I've had a lot of surprising to me conversations with people during this pandemic where they were like, actually, I think that we do need the state when it comes to disasters. People who I didn't expect to say that. Um, because you know, I have one friend who lived through Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, or you know, took conversations about these various kinds of disasters we're facing, including pandemics. Um, and so, for me, you know, we're obviously thinking about lots of different kinds of disasters: public health disasters, environmental disasters, fires, floods, storms, all the disasters. Um, it was really powerful to me to hear the story about what happened in Hong Kong at the beginning of the pandemic, when Hong Kong, when uh, there were the first cases of COVID in, in um, Hong Kong, and there's such a giant, powerful anti-government protest movement happening there that's been going head to head with the police and that has mobilized so many people and, and has included so much mutual aid. And there was, you know, the, the government of Hong Kong was doing a terrible job and they, they actually banned wearing masks and all these, you know, the, you know, they wouldn't close the border with China where there's, you know, high speed trains coming into Hong Kong from Wuhan. And so the protest movement there did many things like create hand sanitizer stations all over and, and fill them and create online maps where you could find hand sanitizer and keep them full and have huge brigades making masks and make sure they got to poor people and old people and um, you know, planting bombs at the border saying, if you don't close the border government, we're gonna, you know, so many levels, uh, you know, all this work around the organized labor of, um, you know, there were already laborers, uh, health laborers organized through the protest movement and them going on strike. Like, so all these different kinds of tactics. And actually the protest movement succeeded at really dampening the impact of the first wave of COVID. So it made, it let me imagine a little bit, like, can we imagine the people's public health system? Do I have to be sure that the state responses to um, crisis, which are always gonna be about extraction. And when I think about like what's happened in Puerto Rico since Hurricane Maria, like just, it is always about like the big moment of, of looting a place or of looting a people after, um, or in the immediate wake of um, disasters or during, right? Um, so yes, the state does a, a terrible job and worsens um, inequality in the face of disaster. That's tends to be what it does. And I, you know, part of an abolitionist movement where we're always thinking carefully about how to discern whether the next step in a reform is actually going to be beneficial to our goal of ultimately eliminating the police and prisons or whether it's not. So I feel like this question about how we make demands during a pandemic on the state is a very similar question of discernment, right? We want to be asking, it's not, it's not about absolutism for me here, because obviously I have somebody who's fought for people's welfare rights my whole life. Like that's not, you know, it's about saying, um, will this thing pro actually provide immediate relief or is it just cover for them? Will it, um, build or legitimize this apparatus of, of control that we're trying to dismantle? Um, and is the way we're doing it, building our ability to mobilize a lot of people and build people power for the long haul, um, or is it using elite strategies that actually just reify the very kinds of um, harm, harmful hierarchies we live under, um, like the nonprofit system and you know, elite policy strategies, et cetera. So for me, I'm just, I'll just find it finished by saying like, obviously we are headed towards a lot more really brutal disasters, like severe economy crash, severe environmental harm. I, I would assume many, many more kinds of really severe public health problems than the ones we already live under, which are many. Um, and I think that mutual aid is going to play a central role, both in just the day to day of can we survive in our neighborhoods and also in things like occupations. Like I live in Seattle near the part of the, the area that was occupied. Mutual aid is actually like the infrastructure of an occupation. Like it is really what makes it the same thing with City Hall in your face. Like what makes the occupation is the fact that there's tents with food and tents with books and tents with people giving you water and medicine and, you know, counseling, you know, like that. Like so. Mutual aid is central to our, our occupation strategy. It's central to uh, uh, surviving the levels of criminalization of our movements um, in terms of you know, bail funds and all things that are happening in those ways. It's central to you know, the eviction crisis. It's central to um, the, disaster, the disasters that are coming and that are worsening. Um, and I think 
as we grapple with that and as more people take on the idea of thinking about mutual aid and practicing it, we have to grapple with this relationship to the state and this question about whether we're doing all this just hoping that the state will take over for us later or whether we're actually building a new way of living together that, um, it, that doesn't center um, like government services. I think this is so powerful. Um, and if there are questions from the audience, I'm going to hand it over to Gayatri to, to ask. I'll just put, put one out right now um, while people are ruminating, which is uh, one of the things I heard between all of your all comments that I was curious about, and it relates to Dean's notion of discernment, is this question of the way um, pandemics challenge our notion of scale. Um, and how we move between scales. So how we move between the scale of um, the microscopic and the breadth that Amber was talking about, um, the, the scale that Juana was talking about of relations between um, uh, queers um, who try to construct um, not safe sex, quote unquote, but what is meaningful between them um, um, and viable. Um, and, uh, and Kenyon's notion of this institutional histories and then Dean's question of the larger apparatus of, of a state and an alternative to state formations that's much more decentralized but has the geographic expanse um, uh, of, of the state population. So, um, so this question of scale seems to be a big part of, the, of a kind of crisis of what it means to build alternatives within the, the catastrophe of a pandemic. Um, and I just wonder if, if you all have thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I'm thinking about in relationship, obviously, to, to Dean's remarks is, um, and again, recognizing that it's, uh, you know, not necessarily an either or, but just like the levels of complication, because, you know, as, uh, you know, as a Black person, <laughs> um, thinking about the kind of U.S. government, both as like, you know, perpetuating various kinds of, of, of violence and anti-Black violence and state violence and et cetera. At the same time, the current structure of federalism, which sort of privileges power to the states, has actually put Black people in a position that we often have to rely on the federal government to like intervene, right? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> so there's a kind of complicated relationship there, right? And, and so thinking about questions of scale and about you know, whether both kind of organizing in terms of, you know, mutual aid, you know, um, and thinking about uh, more investment versus like divest or kind of direct challenges to state power as a kind of paradigm. Um, you know, it is, it's a question I'm also rest, rec, wrestling with at this point and, and also thinking about what are the, and, and, and how to, Dean also kind of got at this, how to sort of not uh, make the questions of scale often the way like kind of nonprofit like philanthropy funders think about <laughs> scale um, or it, uh, like a kind of libertarian notion of like take care of yourself and like abject you know whatever so like these are the these are the questions I think that we have to, to ask now and I think one of the things that I'm beginning to think about is how how do we think about whether we frame it as mutual aid or kind of uh, 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 investing more in uh, you know, people's ability to take care of themselves uh, you know, in absence of a kind of a government support? I'm thinking to me about the question of like, how do we actually talk about sort of like a deep democracy or, a, or an actual real democracy and what it means to be empowered and engaged and able to, you know, make decisions collectively uh, to, to kind of further, um, you know, various kinds of, you know, whether it's networks of care, support, or, you know, what have you, right, as a, as a, as a political project itself, right, um, or, or to sort of uh, boost and inform how we think about mutual aid and some of these things. So th those are in some ways more questions than an answer, but the things that I'm wrestling with kind of based on, on that part of the conversation. Do other folks have any responses to Chandan or should we go to the q and I have a quick thing to say about that. I mean, this, this invest-divest thing, you know, it's a huge part of all of the work that many of us are doing to try to get cities to 
divest from the police um the, their police departments and take that money and our our argument is like put it towards housing and healthcare and child care and all things that actually prevent people from being in the crises and it's a it's an interesting question for me as an anarchist to be i'm very deeply engaged in that strategy um and i feel um also like one of the things i see in this which really goes what kenyan just said is like people's like living in an authoritarian society has caused people to really want to just call somebody else solve their problems so what a lot of people want is they just want like a different somebody to come in 911 right they want to be a social worker or they want to be like a nice lady and it's like we're all like uh no we that's not what we're going for here like actually those systems those soft systems of control and governance are just as you know racist and harmful and ableist and stuff but this question about how do we become the people who could live in a more self-generating um and mutually self-determining um society are, are big ones that i think often are getting worked out inside mutual aid organizations and other radical spaces um and the other thing i want to say is that really relates to juana's points is that like i think the i think a lot of the reason people join social movements is actually to break isolation and to get laid like that is like like we like we and those are legit needs so how do we create social like you know fun and social and also where we act responsibly around sexuality because there's such a huge history of toxic masculinity and of sexual violence inside social movements and that still is destroying social movement organizations every day all around us so i think there's i, I get this idea from um generative somatics that people are the people's main needs are safety dignity and belonging and i think about that a lot when i think about what kinds of social movement spaces we're trying to make at all the scales like what how can i have a relationship with one other person that can include um a self-generating and also experiencing safety dignity and belonging and not having to trade out any of those things and also how could we create organizations in which people and spaces in which people can have a chance to feel those things which are the promises of the police state and the border but they and militarism it sells we're going to get all those things and it of course does the reverse and so it's just like really contending with those as actual needs people have and not to the extent that someone can deliver them to you on a platter but that they are relational and generated by our Engage, engage with each other. I was thinking uh, for a minute in terms of the state, um, in terms of my line about, you know, are these sort of amorous union, that thing that we cannot not want, is a state that might care for us, that thing that we cannot imagine not wanting. Um, and yet, you know, um, there is this kind of cruel optimism of um, that won't be it, that won't solve the problem. Yeah. So, um, so we have a bunch of questions and we're not going to be able to get to all of them in, in 15 minutes, but we will be sending your questions to the panelists and the panelists can choose to respond to you individually if they choose. Um, so just quickly um, for Juana, um, how do you see hookups and sexual encounters changing after COVID-19? Um, it's just very different, you know, uh, dating is different. I think, um, one of the things that was interesting is, um, well, where this happens, right? So you meet people online or whatever. Um, online sites are either about hookups, like Tinder, or they're about like romance, like okay, Cupid. And neither one of those things seems particularly safe right now. Um, the idea that you're gonna invest in like, oh, let me fall in love just so I can get laid just doesn't seem like a, a good move to make. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's uh, what, what sex means, um, who you're able to negotiate with, um, what that kind of care means, because it's, it's harder you have to really trust someone. I don't know what else to say. I mean, you just have to really trust someone. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Anybody want to say anything more about that? OK. So um, this is from Kaden. Um, they say, I was reading Rubens Thinking Sex, in which she makes the argument that sex is always political. How has the politicization of COVID affected the political nature of sex? And I, yeah. Anybody? I have tickets for the mute. 
I have tickets for the museum. Um, the San Francisco MoMA opened up. I'm going to the museum. I really need it. Um, it's a big airy space. I think I can be safe. Um, so the fact that we're taking risks and that there are certain judgments, moral judgments about the risks that people take, the fact that I live with my son, which is really risky, <laughs> um, and that I kiss him on occasion. Um, but somehow that kind of risk seems socially responsible because he's my son or going to the museum seems like okay. But um, hooking up with someone that I don't spend, tend to spend the rest of my life with seems risky and dangerous and socially irresponsible. So. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to address that? I mean, the ways in which COVID has become politicized in a way that HIV was politicized in a completely different way, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, on one level, I, I think the, because of the sort of nature of COVID in terms of the, how it transmitted or whatever, I think has to some extent put like, you know, non-queer people in a position to have to ask these questions about risk and sex in ways that I think that queer folks, and particularly, you know, gay men, trans women, I think have done for a very long time in terms of like weighing, you know, whatever I need to, I need to get off and like, you know, like, and, and weighing, you know, what you're going to do and in what context, like, I, I think that is like, become so much of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, what it means to be a queer person, right? I think on some level in the context of, of, of HIV or just even, you know, of STIs or whatever, but particularly for, for the AIDS pandemic, um, it is normalized in some sense that that question in ways that I think that, uh, you know, COVID is, is also, I think, kind of folks have to sort of contend with in, in particular kinds of ways. Um, and I think that uh, I think one of my sort of fears as we think about the polarization of sex as it relates to COVID is, so this piece I was sort of talking about earlier around kind of HIV criminalization and then the criminalization mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, people for not wearing masks or social distancing, but again, specifically within black and brown communities where these things have been really implemented. Um, there, you know, potentials for the same kind of criminalization of people who, so, you know, who are throwing sex parties or who are having sex in a park or, you know, these kinds of things, which, which still, frankly, you know, at some point I'm going to write about how like Lawrence v. Texas did not solve the, the problem of police kicking in doors or raiding bars because all these things still happen, right? under the context of queer sex happening. So um, I think that, yes, I, I think that these are, these are sort of pieces in there that, that uh, you know, may emerge. And I certainly see the sort of judgment intra-community about, you know, people going to Fire Island or people having sex parties or these kinds of things, um, you know, that are, that are happening as we, you know, think about the way sex is like politicized in, in the context of COVID. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Guy, can I jump in really quickly right. and, yeah. and just say that I think one of the things, and I think this is the sort of counter-revolutionary moment that, uh, that we're in, um, that goes to what Kenyon is saying, is that in the early moment of, of, of the HIV crisis, I think that the question of how to have sex, a lot like the way Wano was talking, was a question of, of how do we figure survival in the context of utter abandonment? How, what are what what do we have? What knowledges do we have? What do we? How can we build those knowledges into something that might be able to save our lives? Um, and this is happening to communities all the time. Communities of color are figuring this out with everything before they're even called the epidemics and pandemics, as as um, Kenyon was saying in his remarks. Whereas I think that in the case of of COVID, the way that the media and others are covering it. Um, is particularly that it's a kind of lifestyle that one should be able to have the right to do. Um, and it's about, um, I have the right to have sex. I have the right to hook up. It's almost like, you know, my lifestyle is to go to, it, it's how much people mishear what Juana's saying about the, the, the way in which choosing to go to the museum 
is equivalent to choosing to have um, casual sexual relations with somebody who's a relative stranger with whom you've built this interesting um, possibility because you both know how to talk to each other. Um, that's so misrecognized and it's, it's and in, in, in COVID, it's expanding the notion that sex is a right of mine that I can have and that not even disease is gonna prevent me from enacting that right. Um, it's about getting back to the normal rather than figuring out um, how to be in this new moment. Great, thank you, Chandan. Um, okay, so this is a question from Tony Valenzuela. Um, one of the things that has struck me comparing COVID and HIV pandemics is how public health has been perceived differently then versus now. In the 80s and 90s, public health was understood as an arm of the state, at a minimum as falling short in addressing the reality within communities of color of understanding queer sexuality, etc. Pub public health controlled queer communities through stigma and exploitation of fear. Today, public health is the heroic institution, the ones led by science on COVID, without any interrogation of how terribly they actually handled the past pandemic. And in some ways, thank you, Tony, and in some ways, I think Fauci is a great, <laughs> you know, figure that emblematizes exactly what you're talking about. Um, so any thoughts on that and the, in the ways in which, you know, pub public health actually has a very different meaning today than it did during the hmm. epidemic? Hmm. Uh, it, well, it, it depends on who you ask. I, and I, I think this is what's really tricky about it because and I think one of the, I've been in these conversations about, you know, the people, the kind of critiques of, of Fauci and, you know, and his kind of role in the early stage of the epidemic. And to be, and I, I do, you know, <laughs> want to, want to hold that like sometimes activism actually succeeds in opening like channels of institutions for like engagement and communication. And to some extent, the AIDS movement was successful at that, right? To the extent that I, I can say just having personally what met Fauci and have interviewed him for things, just done a, a number of things like, I, I just, I will hold that he may not be the same person he was in 1983, right? Like, and so sometimes like, I just wanna like, sometimes we we win small wins in that, that kind of respect. Now, that does not mean that like, you know, obviously there aren't like kind of major still problems. And I think we're in, one of the things that I'm struggling with now is the distrust of public health as it exists now um, is often about this sort of white nationalist bullshit, right? Like, so, <laughs> so, so on one level, I want to like also hold that like, yeah, we, we obviously have these institutions that have been responsible for a lot of like, you know, bullshit and just like, you know, being non-responsive to different communities or being totally inflexible or just, I mean, a range of things or like, and actually promoting like problematic, you know, um, stuff in terms of particularly in terms of HIV in terms of like the the CDC response or whatever right has been like we've been fighting the CDC to this very day around um, certain kinds of things so that hasn't that actually hasn't changed right I think on some level I think where we're in an interesting moment is there's you you have on one level from our perspective ways in which we've tried to push these sort of public health institutions to be more responsive and more frankly humane and to in, and to resource different kinds of work and, and be less stigmatizing and whatever um and that's one sort of critique and that but we're in this moment of uh of the right wing sort of push to discredit these institutions which has been at least a 50-year strategy in order to deregulate and defund them right the fda cdc the nih etc and to politicize all these institutions to their own end and so i think we have to really and it's something i don't necessarily have an answer for but it's something i'm really struggling with is like how to hold my critiques of these institutions and the activism and work that we've been doing to sort of challenge and push and etc and not also come across or kind of collude with a space of the kind of the, the kind of anti-vax you know uh 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 libertarian kind of you know uh 
you know, and kind of right wing push to kind of deregulate these systems, right? Like, I, so I, I, it's not, it's not an easy either or, right, in terms of where the, these institutions were in the early part of the pandemic, of AIDS pandemic, and where they are now. They're still problematic. And yet, I, we have to be able to kind of like fight and push with them, but also like not collude with like, or be kind of structured in such a way that we align ourselves with uh, people who also do not have our best interests. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, Kenyon, that I feel like that's the tension that we've also lived throughout our lives with, around welfare, where it's like, oh, the right's attacking welfare. Mm. So now we have to be like, oh, no, no, keep welfare. It's wonderful. And it's like, this is a horrible, dehumanizing, racist, brutal, sexist system designed to control and destroy people and kill them. And, and now we're in this fucked up position of defending it instead of being like, what we really want is like actual housing and actual, you know, deep support and well-being for all people and to stop extracting from our communities and destroying them. And that feels like this, it, this is this relationship to the state question that is like so challenging and this continued liberal fantasy that I think Juana was mentioning of just like people want the mommy daddy state to show up. And it's like, it's, we know what this thing is, but we're in these really vexed positions in relationship to it. Mm -hmm. So we're actually out of time and we have so many amazing questions. Um, so we will be sending that to the panelists, but I just wanted to thank you all so much. This is such a necessary conversation. And Chavin and I, we were talking about maybe having a part two next semester. So stay tuned, everyone. This is, I mean, just the amount of folks who tuned in for this means that there's really a, a hunger to hear a kind of queer critique of what's happening right now. Um, Chavin, do you want to send us off? No, I won't. Well, uh, uh, I'll just thank the panelists as well. Their brilliance um, just made this panel so valuable um, and I've learned so much as I'm sure others have. And thank you guy three for just hosting us. It's, it's of always great. Of course. Thank you all so much. We'll continue this conversation. Okay. Bye. <laughs>